How much did these tickets cost? Nothing. Good. By the way, I'm a head. And what are you supposed to be the god of again? I'm a disembodied, decapitated head. I've been playing a guitar with my tongue. Give me a break. Phobos is the son of Ares and Aphrodite, and is the fraternal twin of Demos, the god of terror. I presume that fear, Phobos, the Greek word meaning fear, that is used to represent this god, is meaning the high-octane, high-energy fear that people would quickly become mentally drained from and would not last very long whereas that someone can remain in a state of dread for long periods of time. That's uh, like a, a trauma. Wanton, erratic, tumultuous panic is large and powerful, but short-lived, or it is that mayhaps dread may be more consistent, but not as dramatic. It is said that Phobos is depicted, or at least referred to, as accompanying Ares, among other gods, upon a chariot into war, or upon a ship, or transportation, means a means of conveyance of some sort, into combat. However, seems to only serve the purpose of being able to build upon Ares being a, an, an anthropomorphic personification of war, that their Phobos can pose as an anthropomorphic personification of fear to accompany Ares as another human might, another human being, that fear accompanies war. It is availed to this being that Phobos was depicted upon or referred to in the Iliad, the story of the Trojan War, as being emblazoned upon the shield or present, the vestige was displayed upon the shield of Agamemnon, and that that image was that of a lion's head, or that Heracles, the son of Theos, was uh, bore an image of Phobos, and that his eyes were on fire and big teeth uh, uncertain. It is said that Phobos and this presumed subsequently Demos were young boys, possibly in association with that they are a new generation of gods after Ares, which might mean that they're younger than Ame or Hermes or and Dionysus, which were the youngest of the, the, the second generation of Olympians. Regardless of how old Phobos is in comparison to the other Olympians, being of the generation that descends from the, gen the second generation, this associates them with being younger, though this wasn't aware of that when this sculpted had Phobos sculpted. It was said that worshippers of Phobos, including Heracles, or uncertain if it was specifically Heracles, that Heracles worshipped Phobos, that warriors in general, as they worshipped Ares, would have, might have also worshipped Phobos, that the Spartans revered Phobos as a, a god representing discipline, or mayhaps the, a god that provides the psychological state that the discipline that evokes or presents the necessity of uh, generates the demand for discipline to a great degree, specifically in combat, mayhaps. Regardless, that Phobos, like his father, delighted in, was sanguine, delighted in blood and death, and that either he or worshippers of Phobos would decapitate strangers and build temples out of the skulls. This is uncertain if the word phobia is derived from the ancient Greek word meaning fear that is also used for the god of fear, the ancient Greek god of fear, or if the word phobia is derived is eponymous for the god itself. Regardless, phobia, phobos, this word is a household name. It's very prevalent in the world, like psychology, psych, the goddess psych. These gods seem to receive very little attention compared for Theos is well known, Apollo is well known. These are gods that are not things we say all the time necessarily. It seemed that there were no statues, no stories where this character did anything. And so this, and fear is something that plays a very, very large role in all of our lives. This thought that Phobos should get some attention. So I thought, well, I'm going to make a Phobos. When beginning this thought that since Phobos was the 
offspring of Aphrodite, the ancient Greek god of banal obsessions and beauty and lewd, lecherous, lascivious, wanton, tumultuous escapades and so forth, that he should be beautiful, that he was the son of Ares, war god, and was to embody fear, or specifically the fear of loss, in to be in tandem with his uh, maternal heritage having to do with things that are preferable, wanting, and therefore combine dread and mortality, you get the loss of something good, but still a reference or including the presence of something good, regardless of how much this incorporated that. This thought that Phobos should be this beautiful male character, this wasn't, this hadn't intended to make him bald, this, uh, the hair didn't, sh the hairline didn't show very well, this wanted to give him a buzz cut appearance because that was very soldier-like, associated that with, I suppose, power, with strength, with uh, perhaps uh, Spartan-esque or uh, abnegation. I suppose hair uh, personally is often uncomfortable and you sort of wish that uh, being bald has this uh, offensive or look that's not preferable but hair is uncomfortable and you think oh, having short hair works fine. It, that's what this wanted to give to Phobos, but this he the piece ended up looking bald. The body of Phobos is curias, or the ancient Roman imperial elite leather strap tassel laden or embellished, embroidered, scintillated garment, fastened garment, is derived from a picture from the film Gladiator, Commodus, one of Commodus's many stylin emperor garments or armors. The legs, the leg greaves were a misunderstanding. This had, uh, this was, this had looked at the Perseus statue, or silly, or not certain which one, the green one or tarnished bronze one, where this thought that there might have been a seam in the metal somewhere, and I thought that was supposed to be a sculpted seam in some kind of, um, leg grieve special, godlike leg grieve. I don't think so. I think he's supposed to be naked. I don't think he's supposed to, at least other than the shoes and the helmet, I think he's supposed to not have any clothes on, but I thought those were some kind of skin-tight uh, leg greaves, and so I, I tried to emphasize them and make them into bigger leg greaves, and then this, they ended up becoming Phobos's uh, leg greaves. For Phobos's head, this used a specific photograph of uh, the character, the human who played Captain America in some of the Avengers films, and one of uh, so, uh, someone who was accused of murder, purportedly the the ring, the cornea rings under the iris eyes with the drooped brow. The it seems that when uh, a predator is stalking at least one that is quadrupedal, that mayhaps might be the reason why it evokes this quality, that they are lower to the ground, which means they have to look up. Which means if you look up at anyone relaxed, it will automatically be more frightening to them if you have to look up at them. Meaning that your head, look up against, your head is pointing down, but look up. The up, the uh, semicircle, up semicircle gives a manic impression to a character and the down semicircle, I mean a semicircle droops, curves downward, gives this hiding predator looking up at you, deadly, serious sort of shadowed effect that I wanted to use for Phobos. However, this character probably, his pupils weren't going to show, but if this were to do that, this thought that that particular being in that photograph had blonde eyes, I w apparently simply has very light blue eyes, I mistook for blonde eyes. However, this it was said when this found out that Phobos was supposed to have the head of a lion, this decided not to do that, because they didn't think that lions were, were the kind of beauty this was going, this preferred to portray with Phobos. But lions, I think, have yellow eyes or something like that, or yellow fur, and perhaps that was one way to incorporate the lion into that. If this were to ever draw Phobos, this would give him blonde eyes, blonde irises. It is said that when human beings decided to portray their gods as human beings, that this was an innovation, for humans realized that they preferred to see themselves in everything they do, or at least in this particular case. The head of a lion seems to be 
possibly something that was done without that innovation or from before that period. This does not know. It may not have been. Regardless, this changed it. This is, did not portray Phobos with the head of a lion. The term, the lions, the bears, the tigers, oh my, comes to mind, for that is a phrase that has a venerable, a classical aspect to it, that it's, it's an old saying, but it's new compared to the gods, as where Phobos is old, as an old ancient Greek god and is associated with an ancient Greek word, but is new compared to the other gods. This phrase is also a reference to the lethal predators and mortal perils that dwell in or are produced by or otherwise of the natural world that drive us by fear and force us to turn to each other and confine us to social order and to ha the strain of having to escape or separate ourselves from the, the brutality and depravity and drudgery and perversion of the mortal world. In the God Khan, Barbario was punished with the Philolobos, which is a place of pure evil that was ruled by wolf demons where there's infinite pain and infinite fear, infinite everything, and things that even transcend everything we know. It's the worst thing ever. And part of that is infinite fear, which means that Barbario presents an opportunity for Phobos to expand in a way, giving him extra room a whole new place to expand into, it gave Phobos in a way a new livelihood, someone who would have to bear unlimited fear. When Barbario creates the dark strength that allows him to, rather than trying to suppress fear, but use fear to his advantage, it ends up giving Barbario something, a dark gift, if you will, and as a result, the two of them are very, have a, an affinity for each other in a way, but they're not friends. Barbario ends up killing Phobos's mother, Aphrodite, uh, in the, at the beginning of the Barbarionic Wars. Barbario, uh, by taking on the burden of the Philolobos, had given Phobos a great deal of spiritual gifts that allowed him to expand, in a, expand his consciousness in a way that he had never known or would never have known, but then then he goes and kills Phobos's heart to a degree. And there is a great deal of enmity and hatred for that from Phobos. Phobos had a great deal, has a great deal of disdain or hatred toward Barbario and however helped him to conquer the Omniverse during the Barbarionic Wars so that he would have the opportunity to strike later. Phobos would then accost Jesus and elicit him to attempt to destroy the steeples of Barbario in order to prevent him from rebooting the Omniverse. It doesn't work, but it was an attempt to overthrow Barbario. In the God Con, there was a, a moment during, possibly something that was filmed during a, one of the improv bits that were filmed, it wasn't, Phobos wasn't in it then, but it w he was supposed to be in the God Con arcade playing the Logener setting on the game Fright Den when the the tournament where Jesus was fighting Santa was taking place, specifically where the world serpent comes out. I don't know if we filmed that particular part. I think we have the last part of the of the tournament or the, the the serpent, the world serpent might have occurred in the first part, which might not have been filmed. We filmed the second one and the third one. When the steeples of Barbario, which are these structures that hold the foundations of his mechanism that uh, helps him to amass control over the Omniverse as he conquers it, were being threatened, what they do is they transform into something that whoever is attacking it respects, in the case that it's a god, because only a god could destroy it. And therefore, it, the god could destroy it, but won't. And only by destroying what they respect could they undo this thing. They would have to make a bit of a sacrifice, in a way, which none of the gods were willing to make. But Phobos sought out Jesus because Jesus... Phobos always uh, had an animosity toward Jesus because Jesus had a, a very glib 
or a very... Um, there was something the Iron Monkey once said, and that was, as when disguised as the Supreme Chancellor or somebody, he said, if you take nothing seriously, you will always be at ease, or something such as that. And Phobos always angered with Jesus because Jesus was a person who never took anyone seriously. To him, everyone was a pawn in his game and existed for his amusement. Nothing hurts him, nothing bothers him. He doesn't seem to form attachments to much around him. And because of that, nothing really bothers him. And this always angered Phobos, but because of that, Phobos saw an opportunity that if Jesus doesn't really care about anything or anyone, and it occurred to him during Jesus' fight with Super Saiyan God, Super Saiyan Vegeta, yes, this did happen, <laughs> um, when there was a moment where Vegeta, we didn't film this, but there was a moment where Vegeta was confined in infernal chains, specifically one of the attacks from Mar uh, Marvel Nemesis, not Marvel Nemesis, Marvel... Marvel uh, Ultimate Alliance, Ghost Riders, one of Ghost Riders' attacks. Uh, Jesus evoked that because we had been playing that earlier, I suppose. And so he, he evoked that, but a god version that could confine Super Saiyan God, Super Saiyan Vegeta. And it locked him in the chains. Unable to escape these chains, Super Saiyan God, Super Saiyan Vegeta compresses himself with his own chi into this ball, sort of such as in the Majin uh, Buu saga, where... Gogeta or Vegito is in that candy ball, but he compresses himself, but so the chains surround him. They turn into like this puzzle liquid that surrounds him. So now he's locked in the ball, and then he tries to hit him as this gumball, but Jesus is still so fast. He, he, Horvatska, the dance dance revolutioned around Jesus and can't. At which point the apparition of Bellman's memory of Dina flies away th out of his chest, and and that's when at that point Bellman drops to his knees and says, "No, Dina, you have to come back." And of course Dina does whatever the boop Dina wants. And <laughs> after all of that. Vegeta still can't believe that Jesus is still joking. He's still this is still all a joke to him. And Vegeta asks, "I've destroyed your memories, your mind, your spirit. What do I have to do to end you?" To which Jesus responds, "Well, I don't. I don't really care about any of those things." Not only was Vegeta stunned, but. Phobos, who was watching, was also, uh, this angered him because he, it exemplified why Jesus was, Jesus is one of the few gods that can deflect the amygdala bolt. Amygdala bolt. <laughs> Looking at that, Phobos thought that Jesus was the god who cared just enough about life and about reality that that he might want to intervene, but not enough that he would care that he has to sacrifice uh, what he sacrificed something that he cherishes in order to do it. And so Jesus ends up uh, trying to destroy the steeples, and the steeples turn into an argument, because he's a champion debater, he reveres debate. And so he attempts to argue against the steeples, and each of the steeples uh, turn into a different argument. And one of them was the argument of meaning. And the argument of meaning said that basically meaning is a, a platitude that people have, don't have the nerve not to go along with, but everyone knows that life has no meaning, essentially something like that. And that uh, then Jesus made the famous cereal box argument, cereal, bowl of cereal argument that uh, some people, that he, he hates cereal, but he eats it anyway. And there just has to be... Just has to be something about that, you know what I'm saying? And if if I can eat cereal that I hate, then life has to have <laughs> me. And so that's that's Jesus' argument. Phobos probably believes that Jesus believes that, or that Jesus finds meaning in order. That Jesus looks all around and sees patterns of complexity perpetuating themselves and seeming to circumvent obstacles to build upon itself and conserve characteristics and that therefore that that must parallel an, uh, an, an eventuality, an objective, that it must be going somewhere and that therefore the process must parallel an intent or a meaning. But that if, if it is the sedulent progression toward a goal, 
that indicates meaning that there is one thing more than anything that everything, living and not, is has been uh, progressing towards since the very beginning, since day one of all reality, and that is something called heat death, the end of all things. That some things are living, some things are not, some living things become lawyers, some doctors, some eat bowls of cereal that they don't like, but all things die. And that therefore, that must, if anything has meaning, that that must have more meaning or the only thing that has meaning would be the only thing with meaning in the universe. And that immortal or otherwise, Phobos probably believes that Jesus' life has plenty of meaning, if it is of any consolation to Jesus. Let's say you, we realize your life's meaning right now. Similar to Ame or um, uh, Hermes, it seems that Hermes, that like the Flash, Hermes is associated with speed, I suppose travel, but also because Mercury I notice is a small body that travels many revolutions around the sun. Not necessarily further, but more times, and so it's considered fast and hyperactive, the crackhead of the solar system. <laughs> but Phobos is also a celestial body. It's a, a satellite, an orbital satellite, or a moon, if you will, of Mars. And it, one could say that if Mercury is traveling around the sun, well, the, Phobos is a small asteroid that's traveling around and a celestial body smaller than Earth, that it probably makes more revolutions per unit of time than Mercury does, than, and that therefore that Phobos could be considered faster in that way, or at least um, may, I was thinking that uh, be, I did, this didn't want to just make another speedster, like another Flash kind of character, but I thought that that was an interesting addition to his character, that maybe to play on the fear god characteristic that he would glitch a lot. In a way, maybe he would be a very vibrating character. He wouldn't move more than the speedster god, but he wouldn't go very far, but it would be good for controlling people, trapping them, being in many places at once. Lots of travel, but not really going anywhere. Scary concept, isn't it? Phobos, in the God Con, uh, this didn't know that Phobos was supposed to be a boy at the time, but when Phobos is a boy, whenever that is in the scheme of the God Con, is taken uh, by Apollo. Uh, basically said, come on, get in, I'm going to take you for a ride, so to speak, on a field trip. So they go to Earth, and they go to this uh, place where, essentially a workplace, a place where human beings make their living, uh, are sur trying to survive, and he brings them to this building. It's a building, it has structure, it has people, and you see people being selected for work. And essentially the point of their travel here is to suggest that some beings have what it takes to be invited to a place of beauty, a place with, uh, p of power, uh, be availed a means to make a living, that some people have an essential quality that permits others to look upon them and see not only what they want, but what they need. And that as a result, they cannot help but consider you their equal and would give you the world for you to be one of them, invite you into their homes, invite you into their culture, give you the, the knowledge and the skills and the attention, everything you could possibly need to do well and everyone else dies and withers. And tells Phobos that what you have is given to you naturally, is handed to you, but you don't ever let it go. Because if you ever let it go, you'll never get it back. So Phobos, uh, in a moment of epiphany and expansion of class consciousness and class awareness, becomes an anorexic, trying to work as hard as he can to become this perfect being or so, and so forth, and plays the plays pestilence in a in a play that was orchestrated by Dionysus, one of his uncles, I suppose. One of the things that Barbario gave to Phobos as a result of the dark strength working in tandem with or, or, and building upon fear is the, is the ability of Phobos to find in its soul the solid foothold, the stable ground that would permit Phobos to march forward into everything good in life, but not have to go too far because there wasn't stable ground where it was just right.
With this, Phobos was able to overcome his anorexia and become a more powerful god. Phobos wields a weapon called the Existential Tether, forged for him by Hephaestus. To understand this weapon, imagine that a personality trait were something like a cell in an organism, and that the shape of this cell were, was like an antenna that could receive a very specific signal, that, like a, a DNA signal that only it could generate, and that it used that energy and that information to nourish itself in some way, and in the process changed it and then conducted that energy into the stream of consciousness. By changing the stream of consciousness, it uh, makes some contribution to your being in general that influences the personality traits around it, and by, cause, by not only providing something to them, but causing them to be more like that personality trait, it causes them to, it causes the other personality traits to not, in, to respect the space that it occupies and not encroach upon it, allowing the antenna to retain its shape and the process to continue. Propose that at some point, this personality, the, the process of that some part of us, that this personality trait dies, that some, part of us, that some part of us dies inside, and causing who we were to become who we are and who we're going to be, and so forth. That parts of this cell, this personality, psychic personality cell, begin to fail. And once that begins to fail, then the cell begins to collapse, and the signal begins to weaken, which means it doesn't get as much nourishment from it, and then that causes the surrounding cells to be less like it and to receive less from it. Then they encroach upon the the cell's shape. It gets even less signal, less nutrition, and it is a chain reaction and results in that personality trait being destroyed. And then, like a puzzle or Tetris, once it collapses, everything shifts and drops a level inward. It compresses itself to a state where it can operate on less. And this is the process by which we die inside and end up becoming new people as a result. Imagine that in, in, the, in the process of this death that some sort of supernatural jack were placed in that cell, maintaining its shape, so that when the cell begins to fail, that the shape could not be compromised, which means that there now the signal keeps on coming in and it keeps getting nutrition that way, and now death has to find another route. It can't cause that specific chain reaction. The final destination style, the death must start anew. You're booping with that Mac Daddy, you're disrespecting the design, <laughs> the, the Grim Reaper. However, eventually, Death does find another path, and the cell dies anyway, but the shape is maintained. However, without the rest of the cell, without the rest of the personality trait to, to nourish itself and change it, it's only the signal. Without that personality's uh, full contribution, the other cells would try to encroach upon its space, but can't, because there is this supernatural block blockade there is an obstruction and even though the personality trait is dead the mechanism cannot realize what what we experience as the death of who we are inside because the mechanism is jammed it is it is obstructed in a way that normally is not possible and because of this your personality who you are is now immortal in a way, it cannot, it cannot die, it cannot become less, it cannot... The whole system cannot uh, Rubik's Cube, Tetris, Jenga Tower compress itself downward and become something less because there is something in its way, stopping the pieces from... stopping the space from being filled by any other personal, psychic cell. As if someone had thrown a harpoon of fear through the book of your life, 
preventing you, inhibiting you from turning the page to a new chapter. However, there is one more consequence. Propose that when a consciousness is forms, that each signal and the contribution of the personality cell, psychic cell that receives it, makes blends into the stream of consciousness. That the stream of consciousness gradually became what it was uh, as a result of the blend of all of the signals and the contributions of the psychic cell personality traits that received them, that channeled them and conducted them into the stream of consciousness. Now that one of them is only a signal, the stream of consciousness is now finding a new level of where it is not going to change again. Now propose that all of these psychic facets are part of a macro psychic system and that every person is consisting of many of these macro psychic systems, like organs in a body, and that the stream of consciousness has to pass through all of them and then return eventually to this one. When the next macro-psychic structure looks at a report from the previous one, they receive, a, let's say, a graph, a, a, a message or some sort of in, a measurement of all of the different psychic facets, and they see one, they see one line on the graph that is dwindling or glitching or translucent because the, the mechanism that measures and presents it was not made to delineate parts that were never, that could never be separate, that were never made to uh, work separately. That the structure of this being's consciousness and the subsequent metaphorical analogy that is being used to represent it is made to react to the very existence of this presentation, is made to react to the effectiveness and the, the vital living substance in each of these psychic cell personality traits. And because this one is missing something important, now the graph line itself is incomplete because it is as a result of the signal that powers it being incomplete. It is not displaying that something is missing so that something can be done. It simply cannot be complete. It cannot be a whole signal because the thing that it's always depended on is now partially gone. Propose that the, the macro-psychic structures, their contributions to the stream of consciousness are part of what make the stream of consciousness what it is. And so they all look at this signal and say, uh, hey guys, uh, come look at this, get a load of that. There's some strange uh, zombie line, this weird glitching, incomplete, not quite right zombie line over here. And, like, yeah, yeah. and that's their contribution, that their reaction to that is how that is changes the stream of consciousness. And by the time that gets back to that personality trait, it's still dead. So it's not going to, normally what would happen is that every personality trait contributes something based on whatever, essentially like a conversation that reaches a terminus in an understanding or at least some state where it's not going to go any further. But now there's nothing talking back. And the rest of the macro psychic structures look at that and are disturbed, but and that that changes a little bit, but that slowly begins to gradually come to a new understanding of dead stop wake fear. Somewhere within this metaphorical analogy or not so clever metaphor for the abstract concept of thought, macro psychic structure or otherwise, there is a bulletin board with a graph with a chart where one of the lines on the graph, one of the graph lines, has a sticky note near it that says zombie line, and the line is incomplete or transparent, glitching, is struggling to exist in some way that is somewhat disturbing. That line is what Phobos's existential tether is consisting of. The personality traits that refuse to die and wither, that are dead but are also not dead and are neither and both simultaneously somehow. And that jack that maintains the space that permits all of this to be possible, that jams the consciousness so that it can't realize the death that has occurred, is not a jack, but it is a, the harpoon at the tip 
that is on one end, or possibly both in some cases, ends of the existential tether, as well as supporting all of the personality traits that are in each of the fibers of the existential tether, which means it's, it's in the tether holding up each of the personality traits, the immortal zombie personality trait, or the immortal personality traits that subsequent the immortal personality that is supported, or jammed, supported, whichever you like to refer to it as, and is also present at the end. This is what Phobos's existential tether is. It is as if much of what we are is a, a yoke or a tenuous veal to be sloughed off or expended and apostatized or abandoned. As if the degree to which we can be a person and be alive and conscious is uh, natural at one point, but then withers, and we end what we lose in natural scale of consciousness, we then replace with gems, we, things we have to find or make ourselves by, or uh, acquire or discover by ingenuity amidst the psychic ether. Though now it seems more so than ever, before I assume in human history where for most of human history, human beings lived in caves and lived in the woods or in the jungle, essentially. There is the ability to, to do this, to expand in another direction, to replace what is lost in human beings. Though it seems that the availability of this uh, knowledge is greater, the ability to produce that results in the availability of this knowledge results in a trend in modern paradigms of civilization to value building people up into tools, that it's more important that they be useful than that they be people. Though there is a lot less opportunity now to become more of a person than you might expect, or that, than it is possible, it is certainly much more possible now than it was before. It is curious that uh, there are human beings at the church or at um, or the hip, the hippie freaky dicky hippie people who say, "Oh yeah, they they act as if they're completely on board for one. Everyone wants to build people. Hey, oh yeah, yeah, hallelujah, yeah, man. Like, and how do you do that? Uh, with prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Or I ask him, man. Yeah. I don't think anyone knows how to do this. There's no playbook for alternate the var variants of consciousness because this is a type of consciousness, possibly as most forms of consciousness, that have been um, neglected. They, that we, we d that there is no legacy, presuming that we don't even know enough about this consciousness to know if it is compatible with or if we will be able to use that or build upon it to a scale to in a similar or to a similar degree that we have done with intellectual capital, with intellectual abilities and mental faculties and such, uh, as we've done with math. Or if we even have enough mental resources to split and then to have to split between many forms of consciousness. There may be a reason why we are as we are. Even the one we have amassed this great legacy of, how many people know calculus and can express the world in calculus? No one wants to feel that their life is a sacrifice for science, a constant marathon, pushing to the limits to see what is possible. You want to reach a state of comfortability, of, of uh, a familiarity that brings knowledge to life and mm, avails the comfort of a world made right in math or whichever, which we may not even have the mental jujubes, uh, mental ju mojo to make fruition, fruition at this point. Though Jesus angers Phobos, this suspects that Phobos is drawn to Jesus by that Jesus is a huge liar and has issues with uh, power and control, needs to feel powerful. And this suspects that Phobos is enticed by that, for there is a glimmer of hope in that, that he is afraid of something. This is Phobos, and if you will part with your money, this can continue to make more of these. Uh, if you can donate at the websites provided in the or that you can reach by a link this will leave on the website. 
if this has something to say about that god in relation to the god con in particular, this will probably, if this manages to produce it, this will make another, another one of these videos explaining it, talking about it. The next one this intends to uh, produce is Ares, god of war.